Welcome back to another Improvement Season podcast, guys. It's me, Pascal Flor, and on the other end, it is Steve Hall. Steve, how is it that you are doing overall? Um, I've got a coffee, so life is better, mm -hmm. <laughs> although it's almost finished, What's so life is starting to get worse. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've been on Monsters for the longest time. Yeah, exactly. Oh, just... That you're drinking some coffee now for the Improvement Season podcast is something new. And I just spilt it all over myself because I was like not concentrating oh, and perfect. like shaking it around like as if it was like wine or something. <laughs> you know, you have to get the, the oxygen in it or whatever to yeah. make it taste right. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm on a rest day, so that's a good thing. It makes life a little bit easier today. And um, yeah, actually... Uh, crazy and not crazy but i'm going in, i've because of how life has been recently my rest days have kind of moved around a little bit so mm. i've started week seven but just day one mm. <laughs> of week seven but because i follow an upper lower split it doesn't really matter where my rest days land too yeah. much there's a little bit of overlap from the final session of like a, a micro cycle to the next but it's nothing where uh i'm under recovered actually a client of mine just recently asked me though, like, do you, cause I modified his mesocycle to have arms trained back to back days. So he literally have like biceps one day and then the next day he also have biceps. And this is cause his feedback was his arms always recovered ahead of time, but he's getting really decent stimulus within session. So I was like, Hey, let's try adding frequency, even if it's back to back days. And, uh, I don't know if you have done that yourself, Pascal, I think you probably have with lateral delts and stuff where they've been trained back to back days. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I'm doing it still. I mean, yeah, some muscle groups just recover so quickly. It's like yeah, bicep, bicep and delts. You can basically do like at least four times per week, in my personal opinion. And then it's more of a question of kind of feasibility of whether it fits into your entire schedule and whether you have the capacity, like mental and also physical capacity, of doing them on a lower body day. Yeah, um, the way that a program nowadays is most of the time have as few exercises on lower body days as possible where it's kind of like so that you can solely focus on just hitting the quads hitting the hamstrings and go home whereas then on the upper body days i'm um, then incorporating things such as the abs the calves then doing on independent if it's a pull or push day doing some bicep work because most of the time you can easily squeeze in like two or three sets of those kind of exercises but on leg days most of the time um the sessions even though that you're doing maybe just four exercises take you the same length um and they are mentally much much harder most of the time i'm i'm the exact same way uh, it's only my last lower body of the week where I do a little bit of additional upper body and it's just lateral delts, upper back, and that's that's it, mm. calves. And um, But yeah, it's my upper back that I trained back-to-back -back days because of having it shifting the day of my rest day. But my upper back, like, I, did, I actually did get sore week one, but that was just because of novelty. Like, actually, it's actually something else to discuss a little bit. Someone asked me, do I regularly get sore? And I'm just like... You know what soreness the only time i can almost guarantee i'm going to get sore is if it's novel if it isn't novel it's something i've been doing a long time like it's v like even if i push to failure and add a set it's just very rare that i'm actually going to get particularly sore in that muscle do you, do, you, do you have it at times though that it comes randomly when it comes to soreness because i just had it last week i did my normal lower body session of like uh, doing bulgarian split squats switching over to smith machine squats and then leg extensions um, and I ended up being so sore, even though that I w am in the midst of the mesocycle, cycle, I didn't change anything at all in regards to then the volume, the in basically also intensity, just of course, accumulating or, or progressing throughout the mesocycle, cycle, but nothing really significantly changed. And yet I ended up being much, much more sore than on other kind of like days. That is, I do sometimes randomly get it. I will say that. Normally it's predictable, but sometimes it can be random. Uh, actually, it's funny because my legs are the things that haven't been... I mean, my hamstrings have been consistently sore this meso, but that's because I recently changed my leg curls, my lying leg curls, the rep range okay. to con considerably higher. So I'm in the 20 to 30 rep range. So that that's led to consistent soreness, but reducing week by week, even yeah. though I'm progressing it week by week. Uh, so it's kind of like counter to what some people would think, but it's just novelty there. And uh, my actual quads haven't been like properly sore in a while, mm. but that makes sense. 
And that's why I'm training them three times a week because yeah. they aren't like they're recovering quickly. But when I went on the cruise to bring it back to, to last week's topic, I did dub- dumbbell Bulgarian split squats and I haven't done those in ages. Yeah, yeah. My legs were screwed for like three, four days. Like yeah. quads, ha- uh, not hamstrings, but the glutes. Uh, but that again, it's one of those movements that just is, you know, if you haven't done it in a while, yeah. you do one to two sets close to failure, you're, you're going to get sore. And yeah, I think yeah. I did like four sets. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, this is split squats in general. You can, if you haven't done them in a while, you can just do one set and then end up being sore for days. Yeah. And just to bring it back to the topic, um, something that I did was, one, it's a trial period, increasing frequency, see if he deals with it fine. But two, the movements I introduced on the days that frequency has increased on the the, uh, leg days are less damaging. So they're more... uh, bias towards the shortened position being most challenging so i think one of them is a spider curl i put in there just to get a bit of like blood flow and get a bit more volume through the biceps but it's not damaging it's not going to leave him beat it up he can probably get that quite in quite easily i can't remember what the tricep movement i put in but it was more of just like a i think it was like a tricep push down variation or something nothing like again very damaging and upsetting to the program so if people are considering playing around you can think about okay what movements are going to be more or less fatiguing and damaging like if you want to try increasing your quad volume you maybe don't want to just put in another bulgarian split squat you put in like a leg extension or something yeah no no absolutely i mean makes makes a lot of sense and in regards then to week number seven um is it that you're feeling much much better because the change of environment also due to the cruise that you think that you couldn't really properly overload there as you usually do in your typical environment and hence also due to probably also an environment where everything is a little bit more relaxing yeah i think the the uh, cruise it wasn't a deload week because i still trained hard and uh, trained consistently and did quite a bit but it was more like a bridge yeah versus like another elevation uh so i don't think really it added much fatigue and then the week after i got back so this is good because it's explaining why this has occurred because I don't normally, I'm not able to go for normally seven plus weeks before needing uh, to back off. But the week I got back, I wasn't able to push as hard because I'd lost a little bit of like the fitness associated with using heavier loading and the movement patterns I was doing. So performance was like, okay. And then it's been this past week where I'm like, now I'm in like territory of I'm hitting a few PRs here or there, but I've still got a little bit more room to progress. So yeah, I think it was just because I just didn't have those very like hard hitting weeks. And so it just allowed this mesocycle to be squeezed out for a little bit longer. It's like if you dotted in some extra rest days, like we have before and we've spoken about, if you want to extend your meso, drop in some extra rest days, whatever, like you're dissipating some fatigue. It was kind of similar to that, where it's just like, I just wasn't accumulating as much fatigue in those couple of weeks, probably. Yeah. No, also this makes a lot of sense. What's what's then, um, are you trying to push through week number seven now and then possibly even doing a week number eight? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll keep going basically until I feel like I need to take some time away. And yeah, I, I know I have, life's a bit up in the air at the moment, but I know I have a tattoo appointment coming up to finish off Levi. Mm. And so I might use that as like a try and get to this point if I can, and then take a couple of days after that to back off because last time I did train immediately after, literally the day after I got the calf tattoo done, I trained legs the next day. And I don't know if that was completely wise. It was fine. It went okay, but my ankle was quite swollen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it depends how the recovery goes this time and how I feel about it. But yeah, that might be a good time to like, again, reset before moving forward again. How are things on your end? Um, as you can see, I'm standing right now. <laughs> oh yeah, of because course. I, I just even... wanted to give it a try to see whether also sitting the entire day causes my hips and also my back to actually experience a little bit more of issues. Man, the sun is actually then coming out and uh, it's changing, <laughs> <laughs> hiding behind kind of clouds again. Um, yeah, th- this is basically what I did. Where I was just like, okay, let, let me just try my very best. I have a standing de- desk at home or a hydraulic desk so better make use of it so i'm trying now to alternate throughout an hour of like standing and then sitting again standing because if you're just doing one of those for too long neither of the two is actually then more beneficial than the other so you want to actually just like 
cycle between the two. And then also, of course, with the mobility work uh, I'm doing, and it's kind of, so it is kind of like a roller coaster ride. On some days, I have the feeling that nothing is improving, that it actually makes things worse. And then on other days, um, it feels like it does its job. It does improve things. Um, I can't really tell right now. And the back issue, though, apparently it's a little bit more severe than I thought it is at first uh, because it's been with me since before then the holiday. Now, of course, it must be said, unfortunately, that ever since before the holiday, I was pushing through it, right? Because um, right before the holiday, I thought like, okay, I'm not going to train throughout the holiday, so I'd rather push through it so that then during the holiday time, I can take some time off for the back to then heal up. But then, of course, snowboarding and skiing itself, like the twisting and turning movements, uh, the back is still involved quite heavily. And then I came back, not having really trained the back properly, and I, of course, wanted to then go back. And now the up, the next holiday is already coming up here at the end of March, which is also going to be a skiing trip. Um, oh, damn, all the skiing. Yeah, You're switching yeah, yeah, from yeah. a bodybuilder to a skier now, yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to once again train through it and all that kind of stuff. So it never really gets the rest that it needs. And it feels as if it's some kind of herniated disc. At least that's how I would assume that it feels, right? Kind of a little bit nerve pinching and with twisting movements is kind of like that sharp pain. Thing is, though, that I don't think it's a herniated disc. I think it's more like the lat attachment because I found a spot here, right? Uh, that gave me some issues, which has also been the case where I felt it the most when it started up flaring up. It's kind of like right where um, the lats attach to the lumbar spine. Um, and if I really press in there, I, I, I can feel like a nerve pinching sensation going through the entirety of my lower back. Um, so I, I, I just think that it's a matter of um, having... I don't know, a muscle strain or so, and it's a little bit more severe, and the sev more severe muscle strains take even a couple of weeks to then mm. also heal by itself. So, as you can tell, lots of different things that I need to actually be wary about. Sometimes I have a run where I'm not actually experiencing any kind of discomfort and pain. Sometimes I don't, and it's unfortunate right now, but I think that it has also then, once again, caused a little bit of thinking on my end to then be a little bit more on it when it comes to mobility work. I think that not everyone needs it. Probably someone like you, Steve, who doesn't really experience any kind of pitfalls to not doing any kind of mobility work. Um, but for me, having gone through hip surgery, maybe it is very much needed for someone like me. That's, of course, just pure speculation, but it could very well be that this turns out to be true. Yeah, it's always... That's actually, I don't know why this is just throwing something into my head, but uh, as we've brought him up before on the Modern Wisdom pos podcast, Chris Williamson, mm. he was just doing like a Q&A episode and he talked through, he got, um, I think he's got some slip discs or something along those lines. He's got back issues. Yeah. And he said he was doing like the big McGill, uh, Stuart McGill, big three. And he also got some like stem cells planted in, but with the stem cells, I think it was something like you have to take three months off the gym and you can't train. And he was like, so I can't tell if it was taking time off or the stem cells. Mm. And it and he was like, he has no evidence to really push like getting stem cells. So he's like, do the big three, take some time off, like proper time off. And I just know from myself, like the only severe injury I had was my shoulder where I had a slap tear and it just wasn't healing, wasn't healing, nothing was working. And then I got hit by a van, I was in hospital. <laughs> and so I couldn't train it for months and months and months. And then when I came out and started loading again, I was like, oh, actually, I don't need this keyhole surgery. I've got the slap tear, but I don't have the problem. And so the only way it solved itself was taking time away. And yeah, it just makes me wonder if in your case, like if you just, I bet if you just didn't lift <laughs> for yeah. like two, three I, months. A hundred percent, Steve. Um, and I think that this is where you stand in your own way at times. If you are, and this kind of brings me back to the point of what it is that we've discussed last week in regards to bodybuilding being a sport or not being a sport. Most athletes, and I know it from uh, my old roomie who was running on a professional level here in Germany, um, when he got severely injured, he was 
for one season completely out for, for one entire year and he needed to heal and he needed to actually then commit to it because he knew that if he doesn't do it then his career is going to be over sooner than he wants to so he had to actually then take the time off if he really is serious about this right and this is then where maybe the the stubbornness of someone like me comes into play and stands in my own way because if or well, maybe it is the uncertainty where it's like i don't know if it's going to solve it what what if you know the question of what if which is never really a valid and good question to ask because you never really know until you try it and do you really have anything to lose no not really right because if it doesn't heal then you are also a little bit wiser and you, you can probably take some measures and have some more information that you can take with you to the doctor telling like hey i already rested three months or so and it didn't really resolve itself so you can't tell me now anymore just rest just it anymore. And it's going yeah. to take care of itself so no matter what it is that you're doing um it will probably be beneficial to take some time off it's just i th i don't know why steve i can't tell you why it is then so hard of really taking some time off yeah i do i think it's again it's that uncertainty of like especially if you took it, it would be all right if you took a week off and you're like oh it feels so much better it's getting better and better every day but it's not there you took another week and it's progressively getting better but what if it just felt the same after a week two weeks off are you still going to take another third week fourth week off i don't mm. know if i could stomach that that's, i'd need to see some sense of improvement <laughs> that's the thing now i have to say steve i had yesterday a kind of a win experience so a beneficial experience when it comes to the mobility around my left hip because i i'm very focused on my left hip of improving the mobility on that part simply because the right side is much much better of course and improving both at the same time doesn't really make sense if one side is lacking massively like massively yeah. um so i'm focusing mostly on my left side and there's this one stretch, I don't know what it's called, I have no idea, but where you then sit in a position, uh, upper body upright, and then the one leg is straightened and the other uh, leg is then being crossed over the leg in a flexed knee position, and then you are trying to hug the shin and the knee. And this is something that I, I can't do. I can't do simply because of the limited range of motion in my hip socket. So what it is that I've actually managed to finally do yesterday is really to hug my leg. Now, it was a chore. It wasn't beautiful. I really needed to fight to hug it, like properly hug it, and not just like with my hands hugging it, but really kind of sitting in my, in my uh, elbow socket, basically, and then really pulling it into my body. And that was kind of a win. And this is, I think, a great feeling just overall being able to see somewhat of an improvement in terms of range of motion now will it carry over into having a better experience when it comes to my hip only time will tell it's nice to see those wins actually and i don't know why immediately when you were talking me through that i was like you considered yoga i've considered it in the past and there's one thing that is called i don't know if you've ever heard it steve ying yoga no it What's is that? more like a so yoga is i have no idea so i'm a yoga type of guy who has no idea of yoga in general right so i don't know what type of different types of yoga there's out there and what the differences are and all that kind of stuff but yin yoga i was uh, actually seeing is holding positions for much much longer like often two minutes or so right just hanging out in that certain position and um, I need to then have some kind of resource running in the background that then puts me through it, as discussed last week, because otherwise you're, you're not holding it as long as you should. So I was then going through kind of YouTube channels, and they are so, so fucking boring. It's unbelievable. <laughs> That's not my type of content. Like with that, you know, the music in the background that is running in a massage salon. Yeah, um, peaceful. Yeah, like, like I don't know, a rainforest sounds and all that kind of shit, you know? And then, you need to go to Bali. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then also the way that they are talking, like very, very sensible, like 
calm down, relax, breathe through your nose, right? It's not the type of thing that I, that is for me, right? Uh, it's it's not fast paced enough. I like Tom Merrick, the body weight warrior, because he does it in a very, very nice manner. Um, and I have the feeling that it's more about kind of the thing itself and not about some kind of spiritual jazz. Yeah, know? there's more to yoga than just flexibility yeah for sure. man my soul is already kind of pretty rotten so i don't need to have any kind of spiritual experience so just give so me you're the, the body. exact person that needs it <laughs> yeah I, I just need the body thing not the spiritual thing uh but i would be the same like if i've tr i've thought about i think me and charlotte actually did one yoga video on youtube once and we just never did it again because it's just like <laughs> yeah. i'd have to go to a class yes i understand why yoga classes are such a big thing because I need to I'd need to be in that environment and I think if I did that maybe I'd start to enjoy it uh but yeah it's um yeah I could see some benefits of doing like yoga and being able to yeah. at least get into that calm mindset like some recovery it feels kind of like a bit of an active recovery type of thing to be doing but I'm glad it's improving at least on your end even if you've not seen the benefits yet play into your training I think it's probably one of those things that would take a long time anyway and it's you have nothing to lose by doing it that's the way that I see it I, I can only win at, I think that I can still, even if it doesn't really fit, um, um, fac, flex, uh, flex, um, what is it that I want to say? Fix the issues that I'm experiencing. I think it can still offer some, some benefits in terms of range of motion and mobility because my mobility is like utter garbage, utter garbage. And I don't think that your body is supposed to have that type of range of motion. I think a little bit more athleticism and proper movement patterns, being able to get into certain positions will only benefit me. There's Especially, no downside to it. It sounds like, at least for you, it's kind of one of those, it's almost flexibility is just a word people hear. But when I think about it, I'm like, what do you need to be flexible for? If you're just a bodybuilder, yeah, you just want to get into deep stretched positions. But if you're a bodybuilder come skier like a like, like a <laughs> skier like a snowboarder yeah. then the flexibility you need for skiing and snowboarding is specific to that and so mm. you need to maybe get some more ranges of motion or whatever or if you're like a gymnast whatever you know these people need even more range of motion so it makes sense it sounds like it your real identifying it as being maybe a problem for you has been associated with wanting to do something that isn't just lifting weights yeah and i think that even the the smallest thing in on a day-to-day -day business is already kind of an issue for me um mm. like sitting on my motorbike at times if i haven't done this in a while is already kind of giving me some agonizing pain on the left side of my body oh, damn. um and even go getting into kind of a split split stance right where you're just like having a wider stance is giving me the same kind of issues and i think that that's not normal you know yeah and I just need a normal type of mobility, flexibility, um, a movement pattern. I don't need to be a, a subtle leopard or anything alike. I just need to move appropriate. I was looking um, at my bookshelf. Yeah, yeah I've got I have that it book. as well. Yeah, no, <laughs> the subtle leopard. Uh, and I just need to move like the body is supposed to move. Yeah. Not hyper flexible. I'm not looking for anything special or so, but getting into positions pain free. And um, I would very much assume that there is definitely a correlation there. Out of interest, skiing, is it a new location you're going to end of March or is it? It is a, a new location. Weekend, yeah, or? exactly. Um, it has to do with so my, my parents in law. They are taking Tony and Hugo for five days because it's also then the. Is it Easter holiday? I think it's Easter oh, holiday yeah. already, End of right? End March, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they are taking the kids, actually, so that Katie and I finally have some kind of um, relationship kind of time, just the two of us. And we thought, like, okay, what is it that we, are, that we want to do? At first, we thought about actually traveling to Mallorca once again. <laughs> Funny enough, because last week someone commented on the video that all the Germans are traveling to Mallorca. <laughs> they did um, as well. <laughs> and we thought of going there for hiking and also mountain biking and all that kind of stuff. But the thing is that Katie is in a position where she's very much afraid of flying without the kids um, because it just pops some kind of 
cinema into her head about some scenarios. And that's why we said like, okay, then let's go somewhere where we can actually commute by car. We thought about then taking another trip to Austria, going to uh, Zillertal, which is pretty, pretty high with the mountains. And there's a high likelihood that there's still some snow there. And if not, even if not, you can still then go out hiking, mountain biking, even there. Yeah. Right? And that, that's why we thought like, okay, let's go there. It takes only like seven hours with car and getting there. That's not too shabby, to be honest, especially for the uh, US audience. Seven hours of a ride is nothing if you really want to go to a different state, for example, right? It takes much, much longer for the vast majority of listeners. So yeah, that, that's the plan. That's the rationale behind it. And um, yeah. Seven hours is about what it takes us to go down to Bude in Cornwall. <laughs> it shouldn't yeah. take seven hours, but it it's always not, takes It's not about shabby long. at all. Um, <laughs> what it is that we are doing is that we are... Uh, dropping the kids on a Sunday, so Sunday evening, then we are driving the first, I think, 400 kilometers, staying there overnight in the middle, and then um, taking the last commute, like, early in the morning, so that we are actually then on the slope at around, like, 10 in the morning. Splitting it up also makes it so much easier. Yeah. It makes it kind of almost like a road trip in that sense. Though. Exactly. Yeah, on the way back nice. home, we are, though, driving through, simply also picking up the kids, and then, yeah. I think it's it's going to be an easy one, though. So is your goal now, was it to train from skiing trip to skiing trip and not have to take an extended break yes, between? that's exactly it. How's that going? Yeah, <laughs> You're it's, like, it's I don't hard. know if I'm going to be able to survive. <laughs> it's hard, um, especially working around all those injuries and modifying the training and not making matters worse. I even said to you, Steve, in the voice message, uh, I had to modify my program now. Yes. And so, because I want to give the the back a little bit of a break, um, but not in the sense that I drop the back work completely. So everything that has to do with lumbar flexion is something that I took out, and especially also then the heavier compound lifts for the lower body, such as hip hinge movements, and also then something like squatting patterns, I took completely out so that I can avoid any kind of pelvic tilt motion. And then also with pulling movements, I'm not doing any kind of isolaterals, for example, where I just kind of lean into the side. I'm doing mostly kind of uh, things focused around the mid to upper back now so that I can take it out somewhat. It's not working 100%. And uh, what it is that I'm then doing is like a pu pull, push, arms, shoulders split for the time being. So today was my first session with that split. I, I needed to modify it in the, mid, uh, in the middle of the mesocycle. And today I did then kind of back work alongside with leg curls. And then uh, tomorrow is kind of push session where it's then focusing around then the chest alongside with leg extensions. And then the third day is arms and shoulders, heavy focus on those, right? And I, I guess that's the best way to approach it right now. And also there, right? I mean, you're still training. You can still then put a little bit more focus on body parts that aren't impacted, such as the arms, the chest. You always have to be careful not to overdo it then there as well, because then you also pay the consequences. And then all of a sudden you're experiencing any kind of issue or injury, I don't know, in the shoulders now, because you did too many bicep curls alongside with pressing movements and all that kind of stuff. So this is something that where you want to be a little bit careful as well. But I think... Um, yeah, that's probably the best way moving forward right now. Do you not see the progress you would like? Are you sick of writing your own programs? Or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan? Then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We created the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change. Sign up today and let's revive stronger. 
Yeah, that I think that sounds smart. And yes, yeah, the arms and shoulder day. I haven't done like a day like that. I can't even remember the last time I ever did a day like that. But I can. That actually sounds like it could be fun. Yeah, yeah. And I think I never had a split where I had a an arms and shoulder day. Never. Or even doing legs on the same day as upper body. Yeah. I, I mean, I have done that a little bit just because I've added some upper body work to lower body days. But um, yeah, having the legs on the back burner that could allow that should at least open up quite a bit of volume to be pushed elsewhere but like you said you don't want to then yeah your muscle might be recovered but how's your joint and connective tissue doing you don't want to yeah. injure your shoulder that would that would definitely ruin skiing and snowboarding and yeah hiking maybe okay <laughs> yeah but i i don't want to aggravate any kind of further body parts now right no. um i don't know if that's the case then i would really need to take a step back and just I don't know, recover for, for a little bit longer, maybe take an active rest, follow with a light, very light week, just to get blood flow going and all that kind of stuff. But um, also there, I mean, there's no value in thinking about it of what can possibly happen in the future. We take one step at a time, see what uh, each and every single session brings and also what each and every kind of week brings, and then we make some modifications along the way. And then also with the other modifications, such as more mobility work, standing, I really do hope to see some kind of positive implications moving forward. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm sure it will. It just, it's a time thing, I think, that will it will be. Um, where's your nutrition at? Is that just like a slight surplus maintenance still? Yeah, I didn't really change anything about the nutrition simply because yeah. I didn't change too many things drastically around the training. And right now I still I, I, I still feel that I look good, uh, so decently good. And I don't really think that I need to go into a caloric deficit or anything I like. Also don't really yeah. feel like it for the time being. And I also want to save it for more so the summertime because I always have the feeling that it's a little bit easier to cut through the summertime. It's warmer. You're automatically getting in more steps. Um, so th that's why I want to postpone it just a little bit longer so yeah. that I then can start a cutting phase maybe around April, May time frame or so. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, it's actually funny. We were talking about to bring it to me for a moment. Because I said I lost four pounds, and then I from the cruise, and then I kind of regained two, and then it, I was like, oh, so I'm not going to regain all of it, and I'm going to be lower. But now, it's like two weeks post cruise, something like that. Uh, yeah, so it's just over two weeks, and I'm back up to my highest weigh-ins now. So I was actually very pleased to see that my weight came right back, which makes me think I don't really. I maybe was just maintaining whilst I was in the cruise and it's just hard to tell actually a client of mine asked me about this where he was like how many days he had like a weekend away where he wasn't closely tracking and then his weight made some shifts and he was like how many days do you leave it until you know how good of a job you did like on the time that you weren't closely tracking and monitoring it's like it's actually tough to say definitely you want to leave it at the amount of time that that trip was so if you're away a week leave it a whole week to let what body weight settle and then see where you're at once you've been back to your normal eating but um, he was only away three days. So I was like, it will take a few days to know how good of a job you did. But at the end of the day, you won't know. And the best thing to do is if you think you weren't too far away from where you needed to be, just get back to plan. And that's all I focused on is like, just get back to where I was, my eating behaviors before I went away. And it's just led me back to where I needed to be. I think it's when people react too hard to these scenarios. And normally it's like they go on holiday and they switch off. And then they really, they don't track and they really don't track and they just eat all the food and they come back and then they're having to switch on too hard the other way. So anyway, I, was, I just thought it was interesting that my weight has come back up to where I kind of left beforehand. And I, it could I th be- I think it's also interesting highs. just uh, for data collection and also as a proof to see how much of a deviation that can occur independent of, um, of your awareness of your caloric intake and all that kind of stuff. And- the deviation itself was mostly kind of fluid related probably glycogen related and how much of an impact it can actually have yeah. with a little bit of a different environment right i was going to be shocked if i'd actually lost like even one pound because there was no way i was like hungry <laughs> during that trip mm -hmm. i was like i really am at like peak mass if i'm able to feel uncomfortably full at times and still lose a pound of weight uh so it also was confirming to me 
that actually mindfully eating is something that, and I have I have good understanding of my appetite and regulation of that. Uh, so that was quite nice and confirmatory too, where again, the more times you do these sort of trips, I know some people get some anxiety about it, like the, the less you have. We always say that experience cures anxiety. I think that's a Jeff Alberts quote. Yeah, absolutely. And once again, I, I find it just always interesting to see how much of an impact it can have on the scale without you needing to stress about it. And then just imagine some kind of one day or one meal of a deviation can already have a significant impact on the scale weight behavior, such as, I don't know, you had a, a meal that was higher in sodium. You had a meal that you had like two, hour, two hours later in the day than usually. Those things can really throw off your scale weight behavior. And that's also why I'm, I'm also a proponent of really trying to be as consistent as possible if you want to have reliable data and especially when you are in a contest prep or so and you want to really make use of the scale weight then try to be as robotic as possible try to have a routine where you are then eating the same basically also volume of food um, at the same times to make it as reliable as possible because if you don't then maybe the scale isn't really the best tool for you and it can only make you even doubt the things that you're doing and um, make irrational decisions moving forward. Yeah, I think that and also not making snap decisions and taking in more data. So like daily weigh-ins, weekly average, that helps like avoid a lot of the fluctuations that you see that are down to things that are just like small deviances from like a, a normal routine. And yeah, take your time, take weekly averages, but be as close to your usual way of eating if if you want that data to be as useful as possible. Whereas, yeah, you certainly, you don't want to go, yeah, I'm just going to hit a calorie average and let my calories go super high one day and barely eat anything the next day. Although if you do average that out across the week, you should probably still see the right trend. But I think for a lot of people that just cause so much stress and anxiety, especially in a contest prep, that's not a smart move at all. Uh, actually, something I want to chat about, uh, or I think is interesting, is that study that came out from John Tromlin on the 100 grams of protein and basically being no upper limit of like MPS, where people are like, hey, after 20 to 30 grams, you get everything you need out of a sermia of protein. You maximize the muscle protein synthetic response. Anything more than that is just oxidated, it's wasted. So you want to spread your protein out through the day to maximize muscle protein synthesis. And it was just great talking to him and just like being like, so how how flexible can we actually be with our protein? <laughs> like, because he if there's no limit, it is quite literally, you could eat all your protein for the week on Monday and then fast and on protein until the next Monday. I don't think anyone's thinking that's going to work very well, but like just over, he was under the impression at least like you, like I, I think you work the same way, Pascal, where it's like protein, you want to hit that daily fat and carbs. They can vary a little bit more, hit a weekly average, certainly. But he was even with this data coming out suggesting, Hey, you could have higher protein days, lower protein days, so long as you hit the average for the week you're okay. So there's just because we're talking about having like routine and structure each day, like it's just because you can be more flexible now with protein intake, maybe doesn't mean you should, because I think that could lead people down and having problems. But nutrition, just to me, especially with this study that came out about protein, and the more we learn about how vegan proteins and plant proteins can be actually really efficacious for growth. It's just opening up nutrition to be so more simple than kind of you ever would imagine and like people have to, especially when you look at like some old school bodybuilding practices and i've forgotten what it's called i forgot the book so it's like a nutrient timing book mm. um that back in the day where it's like all these precise timings to maximize growth it's like actually it's it's far simpler and like nutrition can really happen in the back on the back burner for most people yeah so when it comes to the protein synthetic response of kind of also the window of opportunity where you need to actually have some protein that never really made sense to me like that you need to have a certain window of time to actually consume protein and also on top of it that you can't exceed a certain amount of protein because it, the body doesn't really digest it or to uptake it never really made sense what did surprise me though are the findings that it seems limitless the amount of time that you can have between the protein feedings because um just from my gut content i uh, got content gut instinct i would assume that there is definitely a cutoff point where it's not as beneficial for a resistance athlete or resistance trainee athlete anymore 
And I was always skeptical about something like intermittent fasting even or the warrior diet. But apparently even in a situation like this, it would be feasible. Um, which is very interesting and caught me a little bit more by surprise. I never yeah. really, once again, just to reiterate it, I never really was convinced that you need to, to have like six protein feedings throughout the day because everything else is a waste of um, protein. And also you need to, to split it up because you can't digest more than 30 grams of protein. Never really made sense to me. Um, simply because your digestion takes up longer. The bigger the meals, the more protein you have in a certain meal, the longer the exposure time due to the digestion as well should be, right? And the body is also very, very good at making use of energy resources that you're putting forth. So once again, that part didn't really come as a surprise, but everything else in, in terms of what is the upper threshold of it came as a big surprise to me. Yeah, just uh, I think it. I think it will. If, it's kind of like when I first came across uh, flexible dieting, it was a bit uncomfortable because it was like, "Hey, no, these foods are the ones you should be eating to like yeah. gain muscle and like lose fat." And it's like, "Oh, actually, I can have a little bit of what I fancy. I can be more free and flexible. I can have white rice. I don't have to have brown rice." And then I think for some people where they have been very religious about like I don't know six protein feedings through the day and like no, this is what's been maximizing my growth. It's like, oh no, I can have potentially one but uh there's i mean it's so funny because i think i've spoken confidently about this more confidently than i think i should have given the the research we have but so many people have spoken so confidently about like protein and when we haven't actually had very good research mm. and um yeah it's like you said i'm i'm skeptical that one protein feeding and hitting your daily totals like 200 grams or 150 grams in one sitting is gonna be optimal for multiple reasons but i can understand why it isn't a problem maybe we have to also there differentiate between um, the practical feasibility of something and the theoretical concept maybe theoretically it may be a a proper scenario but also um, is it a feasible approach from a practical perspective like if you're only eating one massive meal mate i don't know if that's even needed and if you want to do this Right. And this is once again just a, I don't know, sometimes certain concepts are being uh, taken to the extreme end of the bell curve. And I never really think that this is a good approach. If you are then taking a concept like this, same goes for the length and partials. I think it's a perfect example of it. There's new evidence that shows you that it's acceptable to do some partials then, especially in scenarios when you are injured and you need to actually make use of those. Perfect, right? And now you know probably that you can have some fasting windows and you don't need to rush and get your protein feedings in or need to, I don't know, go out of your way and just getting the protein feedings in. I think in scenarios like this, this comes very handy. It gives us a little bit more of a clearer understanding of protein synthesis and also it eases our mind that we can be a little bit more flexible with that um, but i don't really think that the study tells you now all right go with a warrior diet and you are going to see the same results as if you are kind of having three to six meals throughout the day because i i still think that it's questionable whether it still yields the same results yeah, I know I brought up a couple of studies when we were talking through it, and there really isn't very many, but there was like a non-significant win in this Yasuda et al. 2020. I've brought up my notes now from the, the podcast, which hasn't even come out yet. So guys, you can look forward to it. We're just like peppering your Angus, uh, as it was. And there was like a non-significant win of three separate feedings versus two. Uh, and I think there was like this OMAD, only one meal a day study where like they lost more lean mass compared to three meals. But it's also, I know Eric Trexler talked about this, where it's like, does this effect drop over time because it was non-significantly different? Um, well, actually, we don't have studies long enough like to, to really say too much. But uh, I think it also, like on the extreme end, I was like in the past really focused on, like you said, you kind of have this most muscle protein full effect where it's like anything between this window of these two meals of protein is wasted. Like I shouldn't have any protein here. Like if I've only waited two hours since my last meal, 
I shouldn't have another one. Whereas it's like, oh, actually, don't need to worry about that. Oh, if I need a snack, I'm a bit hungry. I can actually have a protein bar. It's not going to get in the, the way of muscle protein synthesis, which when, you, like you said, it doesn't actually make sense when you think about it from an evolutionary perspective. Why would the body waste it? Like, it's not, it's not going to do that. That's the so, thing. Why? Right? So this is going back to just like switching on your mind and thinking for yourself. Would this make any kind of sense that the body is just kind of, let, let's just say you only have protein in nature, right? And this is supposed to keep you alive. Only 30 grams, like just calculate it, how many calories it is. So you, you are hunting a deer and you are eating that deer, right? Only, only focusing on 30 grams of protein will probably not keep you alive at all, right? So, so the body will make use of that protein. And we know it, gluconeogenesis and all that kind of stuff is happening, you know? So the body will make use of the protein in one way or another. And especially, like, protein isn't just, like, protein that is then immediately being turned either into energy or being stored or whatever, you know? Um, it digests. And depending on the protein source... So meat, for example, sits in your in your stomach for a long time and then also in your small intestine because of the structure and being broken down it takes a little bit longer. And it never really made a lot of sense to just think about it that way. Yeah, and we had that divergence between the kind of um, acute muscle protein synthetic data where it was like, oh yeah, 20 to 30 grams maximizes it. But if you have three or four feedings and you're 200 plus pounds and you're very lean, you're not going to get sufficient total protein. So yeah. kind of like, oh, so this study, at least for me, this study really reinforced, be a bit more flexible and focus on total protein versus any kind of real yeah. distribution benefits. If I'm trying to recommend something to someone who wants to maximize growth, aim for three, less than three, I'm less convinced is going to maximize growth. More than three, fucking doesn't really matter too much, probably. So, And I think it's great that we get more and more research like this, that alleviates a little bit of the stress that we are creating ourselves right especially i don't know who was it um who was on our podcast i think it was Mano on the round table where he said the limitations of exercise science for example it hasn't been around for long yeah um it's often we don't really have a lot of participants it's underfunded because it is a niche subject most of the time that's why um we are still debating about so many things where we don't really have a lot of evidence that is even good evidence and it is then helpful to have those type of studies that tell us mate relax right if you then have if you're if, if you're living like a normal human being in western society you're probably good then because you will have your protein feedings probably throughout the day right if it's now going to be two or the other day four Probably not that big of a deal if you end up actually taking care of your overall general protein intake. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it was just, oh, I thought it was quite interesting. And people will look forward to that one. That will come out in a, in a few weeks. And yeah, I think it just, especially for the neurotic bodybuilder, which I would put myself still in that camp, but less than I used to be. Because I just, the more I learn, the more I do this, the more experience I have with clients, the more I realize those little details just don't matter yes and just focus on getting the big rocks done consistently over time and i'm not against optimizing at all but normally it's optimizing via those big rocks yeah not via like little small mechanistic things that maybe we have some inkling to think that it will do something but it's, eric helms has been doing a really good job, job of this with data where it's like we have to look at not mechanisms but actual outcomes so yeah mechanistically mps being higher would make sense for more growth but are we actually seeing more muscle growth? Have we got studies showing that? If we haven't, then we can't be certain and we shouldn't make bold claims on it. So I think that's been cool. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, this is also some something that um, happens to a lot of athletes that we are working with. At least I would assume that's the same for you, Steve, that often it's being stressed about certain things that don't really, or that aren't really the problem. So let me just give you an example. Let's say you are training sufficiently hard. The execution is good. Um, and so technique is good. Um, you're pushing yourself. The intent, the focus is there, right? And things can be optimized, of course. Um, you could still work on the technique. It's not 100% perfect and all that kind of stuff, right? 
But in regards to the body composition, your diet, let's say, is a big problem for you. You're binging constantly, right? Your sleep is all over the place. Focusing more on training is not going to resolve it and make the progress any kind of better. So you want to actually put your attention on the actual problem and just solely work on improving that instead of then um, basically focusing on so many different tasks at the same time. People are not good at multitasking in the first place. But also, it is kind of wasted effort and wasted resources if you're putting your focus on something that isn't really the problem. And this is also where then, when I'm doing kind of check-ins, I mostly talk about and focus on one or two problems at one time and want to actually address those. And some people are just, they have a lot of questions, right? But it's then often missing the forest for the trees. We want to focus on the thing that is the actual biggest problem that holds you back right now. Because everything else is secondary or tertiary or not even relevant in the grand scheme of things. If that one single piece is still not fixed or being taken care of. Yeah, I think that's such a good message. It's like for a hyper-focusing on, again, should I be doing a length and partial here? Should I be doing this exercise here? Should I slow down my eccentric here? Should I be doing some more volume on this? It's like, mate, Take all of that time and effort that you're thinking about those little minute details and sleep. <laughs> like go to sleep for a little bit longer, yes. please. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's also kind of I don't know. You can you can take the analogy into the professional field as well of like your occupation. If you're trying to be a jack of all trades, you will probably not going to see the progress or the career and the successful outcome that you would like to specialize. Focus on one thing at a time. Once you master it, or once you are sufficiently good you move on to the next subject or topic. That's the way that I see things. And I think that it is a common phenomenon in many, many realms, right? Especially now in a fast-paced society that we live in. We want to have everything now. We want to have the results now. Especially, unfortunately, bodybuilding doesn't really align with the uh, social media goals anymore of getting the results very quickly. It is quite the contrary, to Not be honest. Not the side, at least. Yeah, exactly. And what it is that you then want to do is kind of take one or analyze one problem, work on that problem and try to get good at that and try to fix it before actually then dabbling into 10 other problems, which sometimes even aren't the problems that are holding you back. It makes me think of just to bring it to uh, bodybuilding again, like peak week, the amount of time and attention people and bodybuilders will put on peak week. And I've been there. If they put that to their posing, I bet that would have a better outcome. Mm. Like actually just 100%. nail your posing. Like you might have the perfect peak, but if you can't pose properly, it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, or, so, or another example is also Steve. Um, Katie is right now experiencing some type of digestive issues for the time being. And she asked me for kind of my recommendation and suggestion on how to improve that. And I said to her, like, it's, it's what it is that you don't want to do is now try to fix everything at once because she was talking about some kind of seeds to cleanse her intestines and then um, doing X, Y, Z. And I said, like, what it is that you want to try to incorporate is actually drinking more on a daily basis, because I know that you are not drinking enough. And then try to incorporate um, vegetables and fruits into each and every single meal. And let this sink for a, a while and then see for yourself whether this improves things. Because also digestive issues can also be sometimes due to other external factors. For me personally, I sometimes experience also digestive issues, even though that my food intake and the way that I approach my day-to-day -day business is always the same. And yet still, at times, I experience digestive issues. And what it is that you want to avoid is just focus on all of the things at once, clouding your judgment of what the culprit may be, and then running out of steam later on because you've tried to incorporate too many changes at the same time. Yeah, and then you never, if even if it improves, you're like, oh, do I have to change my lifestyle like this and be long-term yeah. like this? Or is yeah. what actually did it <laughs> yeah. for me? So, and that's why I said to her, drink a little bit more, add to each and every single meal some vegetables and fruit. That is absolutely feasible. It's not overwhelming doesn't require a lot of time and effort to think about it and to incorporate that. And once you have this in check, you can move on to the next target of yours if the issue still persists. 
yeah yeah i think that's really good advice for people like again pulling people back to not putting the cart before the horse focusing on the big rocks the big priorities i mean this is a general message that we come back to a lot of the time on the improvement season where it's just like keep consistent keep it basic yes learning about the like minutia can be helpful and guide you but not until you've got the bigger picture stuff under control because yeah that can just get you more lost and waste more time focusing on the things that aren't having big yeah. impacts absolutely cool i think that i have nothing more to talk about do you steve uh no i don't think there's been anything we i'm just going to hype up uh no it already been done hope people enjoyed the podcast with martin oh yeah because uh that was a really well ran study and when he taught me through what he had to do to get that done uh and because he doesn't have his own lab he is like his own lab uh just a lot of respect to him for kind of getting that done that was pretty cool so yeah people can look forward to well, can enjoy that and look forward to the <laughs> one coming out with john shortly and we have many yeah. more on the pipeline um yeah nothing else exciting in my head cool. from me at the moment amazing then thank you very much guys as always hit the like hit the subscribe we are reading the comments. Steve uh, wants to actually get better at commenting on those. <laughs> I did go back to some oh, really? from the some. week before, oh, last perfect. Friday. So I probably won't get to these ones till Friday this week. See, perfect. Then, guys, as always, thank you very much. And I guess we speak to you guys next week. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though, it's reality and we know how to do it and we will help you achieve this. The Minicup Movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cut so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cut movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.